Awo Shalom Shalom Aras Tefari Ine Aras Yadinos Tefari Name I am Ras Iadonis Tefari of the line of Jewish society a visionary of this particular society as well as a founder of this particular branch and operation here in the Western Hemisphere and all praise be to the King of Kings in the name of Jesus Christos our Black Lord and Savior Yeshua Ha Moshiach, as well as a member of the Ethiopian World Federation. The Ethiopian World Federation, we've touched on that before, and we will continue to tell our brothers and sisters and seek to advise them to get informed, learn the history of the organization, really who are the real movers and shakers. That means you have to begin with Dr. Malaku Emmanuel Bayan. And there's information out there, but there's not much information or as much information as there should be. So we're seeking to do that which is in our um, power to get more information out there and using means like these vlogs as one particular way of um, disseminating, disseminating our Ethiopian heritage, our culture among the members, among the brothers and the sisters. But there's a couple of matters that we like to connect so that we understand the vision, because without a vision, the people perish. And Hosea teaches us, the book of the prophet Hosea teaches us that my people perish because of a lack of knowledge. And according to our the theological foundation, ancient Ethiopian Hebrew foundation, we know that the original, quote, sin is ignorance. And connected with that ignorance leads to disobedience. It leads to disorientation. It leads to the present state or status of the lost sheep, being lost sheep. So we want to connect, connect um, first of all, the, the teachings and why we focus on Torah, why we focus on the law, why we focus on the scriptures, why is it this focus on our divine heritage? And for those who might not have studied it or seen it before, who have seen it before but have not sat down and really studied it, take a look at a video that we should have on this channel, go to the search, and look for um, Divine Heritage. There's a video, an earlier video that we produced and um, disseminated as a, as a kind of a PSA on our Divine Heritage, and that's contained in the preamble of the Ethiopian World Federation um, constitution and bylaws. Now, another point about this is that we have a couple of copies here and we're trying to um, get some publication on this, some printing and publication on this particular document here. Here, one particular um, operation of the Federation in 2002 produced this wonderful booklet right here. You understand this pocket-sized booklet right here on the Ethiopian World Federation, the Constitution and Bylaws. This right here is, is the pattern. This is our government. This is what helps to restore us in, in a, an administrative way into the family of, of nations, not just as blacks or Negroes, niggers, blacks, and colored. As long as we continue to misidentify ourselves, as Negroes, Blacks, and Coloreds. We remain lost sheep. We remain outside of the, the true family of nations, uh, outside of everything that we speak about, such as um, um, sovereignty, you understand, the matter of, of sovereignty. And we've spoken on sovereignty, and we continue to teach on sovereignty and present the vision, the African Zion vision. But what steps do we need to take in this Rastafari movement? Because movement means activity. However, for the past 40 or so years, that progressive movement has ended up and has reached a, a stage of inertia where it's more passive instead of being active. It's more speculative instead of being operative. And if we continue on that level, the next generation is going to look at us like we might look at other generations as having high and lofty goals, but have done little within our time to really build on that foundation, to establish 
ourselves and to build up so that we will show and prove to the next generation what we say is right and exact and is in spirit and in truth. Now, this particular constitution and bylaws, we, we highly recommend one to get a copy of it. We have some of that information on the internet, but we want to, if anyone knows about any printers or got any printers in the family or, you know, are into printing, please contact us on, on that particular matter. Or if you can, print these particular booklets, the Ethiopian World Federation um, Constitution and Bylaws, get to it. In other words, get to the printing of it. We need more of these. These should be disseminated and circulated. Everyone should ha have a copy and be able to have a copy on their person, as well as um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. A lot of talk has been made on the Son of Man's rights or human rights. However, we also need to study and learn what is involved and how does that connect to the big picture. So how does Torah studies, our focus on Torah studies and the law and, and, and um, um, our Ethiopian Hebrew heritage, our divine heritage, how does that prepare us for the administration of our government? This is the administration of our government. You understand? This, this, this little document right here, it contains the, the principles and the patterns for us to self-govern and administrate our affairs. However, there's, there's one thing missing, and this is one of the reasons why, in our opinion, uh, many activities of the Federation in this present time, past 40 years in the wilderness, has, has, has failed to reach the, the goal of, 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 the, of, the, of the founders, you understand, of, of, the, of, of the original visionaries, the King of Kings, um, Dr. Malaku Emmanuel Bayan, and those honorable generations, previous generations of our Ethiopian Hebrew um, black people here in the Americas who established this great organization, whom the enemy has tried to sow weeds among the good wheat, and this is where we're at right now. According to Christ's parable, we have the, the, the master sowing the good seed, represented by this, the Ethiopian World Federation, and now we see the, we see the weeds and, and the wheat all mixed up together. What does the master say? He says, left it alone until the harvest. That means there's other activity that we must firstly focus on before we can operate correctly and properly in the spirit of this. So let me just share a little bit of this with you before we get into um, some of the deeper levels of this or some of the next aspects of this. So here it says in the preamble, let's, let's first of all show you this. This is the preamble, all right? All right, that's the preamble, right? The preamble. Now, the preamble means like the first word. The preamble is like that, that first word. It says, we, the black peoples of the world, in order to affect unity, solidarity, liberty, freedom, and self-determination, which are, it's a, it's a fivefold like the hand, like the yod, the fivefold principle, unity, solidarity, liberty, freedom, and self-determination. Now, disciples, brothers and sisters in the discipleship level, take notes of this because each of these words, they are legal terms. They, are le they have specific definitions. And these definitions, it, it governs, it governs um, the activities associated and, and, and the maintenance of these particular, they're not just words. Unity is not just Ah, oh, which we all were united. You understand? There's more that goes into that. Solidarity also has a specific meaning. Solidarity, which shows our working together, in a sense, our cooperation. Liberty. What's the difference between liberty and freedom? What's the difference between liberty and freedom? What's interesting is that freedom and liberty are associated with citizenship, true citizenship. So, so this is our link right here to nationhood. You see, the Federation 
in principle, in spirit, and in truth is our link. So before we can um, have a properly functioning organization, we have to have the organization's principles properly functioning in our heads and hearts. Otherwise, how do we know what we're doing? We're just doing meaningless activities, and there's, and there's no time for that. You understand? There's no time for doing meaningless and ignorant activities just out of feelings and emotions. You understand? Out of feelings and emotions. We have to get our spiritual house in order. So it says right here, we, the black peoples of the world, in order to affect unity, solidarity, liberty, freedom, and self-determination, to secure justice, to secure justice. What do you hear the Negroes talking about today? No justice, no peace. Do you hear them speaking about the Ethiopian World Federation? No. They've forgotten, and to their own hurt, to secure justice and maintain the integrity of Ethiopia. Everyone wants to opine about, oh, look at Ethiopia. Things are bad over there, such and such. Oh, what's going on? It is the previous generation, and now it's down to us, 40 years later, you always have to pick up this particular mantle. So we can't just look over there at what's happening in our homeland, what's happening in Africa, what's happening globally, what's happening in our local and, and you know, the various areas that we are scattered in without recognizing, well, what is our responsibility? What is it that we are to do? You understand? And what must we learn first before we can apply the principle? So education is the key. So it says, which is, Ethiopia says, which is our divine heritage? Now, interestingly enough, we left this up on the dry erase board. And here, remember Amos 9 and 7. Amos 9 and 7 is very, very important. Take a note of Amos 9 and 7, because we speak on our birthright, reclaiming our birthright, reclaiming our name and nationality. These are, these are key principles, not just to speculate on it, but also to operate on it, you know what I'm saying, to operate. And this is what we're going to address, is how do we now come from being once lost to now found people? There are steps intellectual, psychological, we say spiritual steps we must take first and foremost before we can now go through the legal and the physical steps that are necessary. So there are, there are stages to this. This is why discipleship is so fundamental. And we're going to show you an interesting link between discipleship and, and, and writing and the language and dealing with the paperwork. You understand? There's that real paperwork and understanding the laws you see, if we say we're no longer niggers, we're no longer slaves, how do we prove that? You understand? How do we make our case, if necessary, argue our case? And, and how do we go through the necessary steps right now to um, rescind all false claims on us because of the past 400 plus years? See, we can't just say 400 years happened and, and we're free, well, in, in spirit, in truth, we are free. But if we are not changing or taking the chains off of us, you know, if we're not, we have to free ourselves up on paper as well. You see, we have to free ourselves up on paper. See, niggas are always talk about making papers. It's just unfortunate that they forgot it's the wrong kind of papers that they started out to make. That's why when they make the other papers, they have no no claim to, they lose it. It's like, you know, all the monies that people have made, even by so-called, you know, illegal so-called operations or other operations, it's like niggas can't keep the money. Why, why not? Because they don't understand the law. You see, there's one purpose for our wealth, and that is to fulfill a covenant. You see? And a covenant is a contractual agreement. It's just like right now with what goes on in Babylon. You know, um, if you get a ticket, they say you broke some agreement. Even though you really have, have made that agreement willingly and in ignorance, unwillingly, really, and in ignorance, some willingly, you know what I'm saying, but overall in ignorance. We're going to get into some of those details um, as we go on. Um, so Ethiopia is our divine heritage. Do hereby establish and ordain this constitution for the Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated. Now, some would say, well, this organization 
is is a thing of the past. You know, there's a lot of folks that would say, yes, that was good in this day, but you see what's going on now. You, we, the black people, see, that's the key right there. This is our, there might be some other black people doing some stuff in Federation name, but they're not representing we, the black people, you understand, know and our divine heritage. You see, so we have to do this for our, for ourselves. So the Ethiopian World Federation Constitution and Bylaws, very, very important. Now, Part of the inspiration for this has been ongoing in this ministry of His Majesty. This is the reason why in the various teachings and video log posts we've pointed to certain books, like even certain books we've repeatedly pointed to them. You understand? Because we think that they have some foundational, groundational information, such as um, um, from Babylon to Timbuktu, this particular this particular document right here by um, Rudolph R. Windsor, and this next one, Valley of the Dry Bones. You understand the conditions that face black people in America? And these books help to establish the main points that we're going to speak on. One, our um, birthright. You know the story of Esau and Jacob? We, we, you know, when you read the story of Esau and Jacob, sometimes folks will laugh at at Esau, say Esau sold his birthright for something to eat, right? What have the majority of niggas done too? Haven't they done the same thing, sold their birthright for something to eat, and they continue to sell their birthright for something to eat? So when we're speaking about birthright, let's understand that we have to, first of all, know what it is, be able to have the evidence, present our case on paper and in person, and individually and collectively before any real changes can happen. Don't expect slave masses or slave masses' descendants and relatives to do it, although there are certain um, Europeans and white folks and others you understand, who have, who, who are trying to help in their own ways, and we can learn something. They understand the main issues here that goes beyond the checkerboard Freemasonry of black and white. You see, of black and white, and that's part of the that's part of the trick right there. Let us um go into this a little bit a little bit more right here. Now, of course, this links with our name change. You know, so when we talk about um, sovereignty, when we talk about sovereignty, before we can really exercise our sovereignty, there are some initial steps that that must be taken. You understand? The first steps are, you could say, intellectual or knowledge-wise, getting the evidence, getting familiar with the, the, the once lost but now found part of our heritage of who we are as a people, who we are, where we're from, how do we get here, you understand? And, and that, first of all, that's the first level right there. Education is the key. Now, the next level, well, how do we um, make that fruitful? You know what I'm saying? In other words, it's not good enough just to know these things. Like the Bible teaches us, we can't be a um, forgetful hearer of the word. Okay, yeah, we hear that. Like people say, yeah, Jesus is black, and Moses is black, and this is black, and that is black, and he's still a living in this whack, whack state of affairs. You understand? They live in this whack, whack still as 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 modern slaves. They're still in bondage. You understand, they're still in bondage because it's that first covenant, you understand, that first contractual agreement that we must repeat, and that's, our, that's, that's the holy covenant, that's our divine heritage. That links with the Shema and, 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 the, and the Simma, you understand, that links with for who we are, where we're from, how do, we, how do we get here, how do we end up in the Americas and the Caribbean. Now, before we go any further, I want to make this link to this vid right here. This is one of the exposed vids, and this is um, Brother Tariq, you understand, Taj Tariq Bey. And here he's speaking on law and government, uh, driver's license fraud. And this is, I think, the second video, driver's license fraud, um, part two right here, this brother right here. Now, this is a Moorish brother, and um, we haven't touched too much on the Moors although that's all related to um, our, our history, our ancestors in the Americas. There were different groups of ancestors in America. 
um, you know, when you look at um, the movements, this is book right here by Dr. Dr. York. Some of you all might have seen this before. This book by Dr. York on um, Noble Drew Ali right here, right? This is this book right here. And, um, who who was Noble Drew Ali? Very, very interesting um, booklet right here. Um, now, who were the Moors? You understand? Who were the Moors? And there's an interesting link. Let's just give you what they say is their, their Moorish American history. Now, this vid, we would recommend one to check out this vid for themselves. Now, um, Taj Tariq Bey, at one point when he says we're not Negroes, coloreds, or blacks, or Ethiopians, he, he says that. Now, there's a lot of confusion around the Ethiopian, Ethiopia identity. And no doubt, you know, you will agree and you recognize that many people have said they were Ethiopians. And they, I, I call it name dropping, have name dropped and therefore have dropped the name. And there's only a few that have been faithful throughout the years to defend the true integrity, biblically, scripturally, according to the divine covenant of our Ethiopian and our Hebrew heritage. And we've pointed to the black Jews of Harlem, the commandment keepers, Rabbi Wentworth, Arthur Matthews, as one particular um, individual that started, that started um, um, you could say, a movement, an important movement of um, the black Jews or Ethiopian Hebrews here in America. He identified that his authority comes from Addis Ababa, from, from or through the King of Kings, but from our divine heritage. There are others, um, Rabbi um, Arnold Josiah Ford. It is him who wrote the, the Ethiopian anthem that was used by the UNIA, um, the Marcus Garvey organization, UNIA. So the link with Marcus Garvey is interesting in many different aspects, the black Muslims, the black Jews, and, and, and the Moors, all have a kind of a link because these were leaders at the time who all were trying to address the needs of this of this lost people now many of the black um the the, the black uh for example ones who were who were turned off by whitewashed christianity you understand tended if they did not find the straight and narrow of the ethiopian faith they went to Islamism or Muslimism. Some uh, um, frustrated by the white Jews, they went to the Islamism, so forth and so on. So we find a link with the basic evidence of who we are. It seems as though all those movements from the 1920s and the turn of the century, 1920s leading up to the 30s, if you look at the timeline, they all was leading to Ethiopia and the King of Kings. Few of the movements remain faithful to that goal, and they're the ones who we find to be the real, um, the real foundation for this organization, the Ethiopian World Federation. But the Ethiopian World Federation, its real importance and focus has been lost in the historical shuffle for most. You understand? Um, and understanding the big picture, it's, it's no wonder that the devil and, and, the, and, and the system would try to take people's attention away from this. With that being said, the whole point about we're not Ethiopians is because the, the Moors, based on the teaching of Noble Drew Ali, call themselves Asiatic, black men, they connect themselves with, with um, 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 Morocco in that sense as their origin and there's an interesting and somewhat um <laughs> there's a friend enemy sort of relationship between we as Ethiopian Hebrews and the Moors. You understand? However, there's there's some things we share in common. You understand this is one of the reasons why I'm I'm recommending this. And that is is as Hebrews and as black Jews, we know that Torah and the law is very, very important. Not just Jah's law, first and foremost, to tithe, that, to tithe your, the 
you know, to tithe that left brain, the 10% to jock. Once you tithe the 10% to jock, all these other things you can get in better order. And we can even see that in the example of the Jews who say they are Jews. That's what proves that our ancient teaching, you understand, is what it says to be, to be truly that thing that raises whoever keeps that above everybody else. And that's, that's the basic reason, you know, um, from, from, a, from a, a, a scriptural perspective, because Jai even says so, our people turn our backs on that con contractual agreement to Jah. And that's what led through the past history, you see, and the judgments and the miseries of the lost sheep. And when we look at how black folks are living today, it is a continuation of that cycle of ignorance. My people perish because of a lack of knowledge. Now, this particular vid right here is, is, is very interesting because um, it's touching on some of the basic, from a Moorish perspective, some of the basic steps that individuals and, and groups of individuals must take in order to defend their, their, their name, their nationality, their birthright, and in order to build and have, not just locally, not just in America, but on a global level, their um, sovereignty back, you know what I'm saying? To reclaim, is to reclaim it, but to also act on that. There, there are steps that must be taken, not just to make a claim, you know what I'm saying? But one has to correct, you understand, what was already done in their, quote, so-called name or artificial name in ignorance. You see, otherwise what happens is that one generation begets another generation of slaves. And then you get folks saying, how come we're still going through this stuff? After all this, it's the same old, same old. Because you keep doing the same thing ignorantly and you expect a different, a different consequence out of it. But here, a little bit of Moorish American history to see how it dovetails with the Ethiopian Hebrew um, movement as well. So basically what you can say is that we both say we're Africans, you understand? We both are about our true name, our true birthright, our true nationality. We have our own flag, you know, our name, language, and flag, but we're representing two different parts of the African continent. And on a certain level, two different so-called religious um, traditions. But the Moors claim to be Moabites. They claim that they're Moabites. And if you understand the history of, of Israel, you can see why some claim more to be Moabites, others claim to be Israelites. You can see the link. In fact, King David's um, great-grandmother, Ruth, she was a Moabitess. You know what I'm saying? She was, she was a Moabitess. But the law says that a Moabite cannot enter into the congregation of the Lord up to such and such a generation. The interesting thing that some Jews actually have argued from Torah was saying that it's speaking of a male Moabite. It said nothing concerning a female Moabite. Therefore, thus, ergo, they argue this is one of the reasons why um, even though the law speaks against a Moabite, it's speaking about a male Moabite, not a female Moabite. But I'm just showing that there is a Hebrew, they both are Hebrew peoples. In other words, the Moors are Hebrew people, you understand, and we as Hebrews or Ethiopian Hebrews are, are Hebrew peoples. And you have the nation of Islam also who acknowledge being of the Shemitic connection and the Shemitic root and being Hebrew peoples. So when Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, when he saw that, that vision of a great horror coming upon his seed, you see what I'm saying? His seed it is speaking of his seed, his children. So we, we look at who are related to Abraham, and, and we have all these people. So it should not surprise us that we have some of our people saying they are more Muslim, you understand, in their orientation, some groups, the Nation of Islam, other groups. The more is saying they're more Moabite, also dealing with Islamism, you understand, or, or, or Islam, yeah, Islamism, some call it, based on what's written right here. 
and then you have the Hebrew, the Hebrew Israelites, a little more in our direction, and then you have at the head, you have Ethiopia. Why? Because of the King of Kings. He is the sovereign. You know what I'm saying? And this is where the real God connection kind of comes from. And it's only the Rastafari, the faithful Rastafari, in this present time, who are defending that once lost, but now again found truth. So let's learn a little bit about the Moorish American history right here. In the year 1886, there was a divine prophet born in the state of North Carolina. His name was Noble Drew Ali. Um, it says, if, if this sounds strange to speak of a prophet born in North Carolina, that may be how it sounded in the days of Jesus, when some thought it strange that a prophet or anything good came out of Nazareth as prophets of olden days came to the people around the world to save nations from the wrath of Allah or the wrath of finite job or God, if you please. A prophet of Islam was sent also to the Moors of America who were called Negroes. The duty of a prophet is to save nations from the wrath of Allah. As Noah, um, it says, and Lot were warners. Interesting they mention Lot because Lot would become the progenitor of the Moabites, were warners to the people of those days. Prophet Noble Drew Ali came to warn and redeem the Moors of America from their sinful ways. This is interesting because in that particular time in the early 20th century, there were many different movements of black people. There were the, as we mentioned, there were the Hebrews or the black Jews. There were, there were the black Muslims. There were the, um, the, the Moors, you know, there were the Ethiopian, um, the Ethiopianist groups all in, at, at that same time. And though they may have identified themselves differently and claimed different portions of that divine heritage, just notice how all that was going on prior to the coronation of our kinsman and redeemer. Yes, that was the penultimate of the prophecy. The prophecy of all these groups is that we have to get our acts in order. You understand? Because Jah is coming. Because God is going to manifest his sign. And, and nationhood, you understand? It's time for us to come out of this. And when we look at this process of our people and we study the scripture, we really can see who really is that lost sheep of the house of Israel. But even when Israel came out, which, which represents we as the Ethiopian Hebrews, even when Israel came out, there was a mixed multitude. You understand? And part of this mixed multitude is the same mixed multitude that we have today. So this is not to, um, you know, we have to be, as Matt said, we have to be um, um, bigger, you know, than we have been. We have to be broad in outlook and really recognize, okay, they say they're Moors. You understand? We know we're Ethiopian Hebrews. They can't claim to be Ethiopians as we can't properly claim to be Moors because at a certain point of our history, you understand, there was a collision. You see, and Brother, uh, is it Sarnetta? I think it's Sarnetta um, had, had touched on it. Was it Sarnetta, Brother Sarnetta? Um, Sarasun Seti. It was Sarasun Seti in some of his videos. He touched on one of those areas of our history where some um, some uh, rebellious Moors or those who were of the particular Moorish order fought against the King of Kings. And of course, if we look at it, we can see some of those same conflicts on certain doctrinal political levels today. But the better we understand what happened then and put our house in, in proper documented order today, the better we can see um, our way out of this confusion even today. Now, the nationality of the prophet, prophet Noble Drew Ali was Moorish American, the same as the people he came to uplift. The prophet uplifted his people by teaching them the truth, the truth as their creed, and the truth as to their customs. He taught them to be themselves and the things necessary to make better citizens of men and women. He, he let them, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> he let them know that the Moorish American 
part a part of this government, the United States, and that they must obey the laws thereof. As a result, the Moorish Americans are good citizens and an asset to the country also. They endeavor to uplift others who have fallen along the way of life to redeem them as to make them an asset to the government rather than social detriments and wards of the government. Prophet Noble Drew Ali taught the people term Negroes in the United States, taught that the people in the United States are Asiatic, and specifically that they are Moorish, whose forefathers inhabited Northwest and Southwest Africa before they were enslaved in North America. Marcus Garvey was given credit by Prophet Noble Drew Ali of being his forerunner. Garvey's teachings about national issues were similar. Garvey stated his in philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey, we will have to build our own government, industry, and cultural before the world will stop to consider us. And Prophet uh, Drew Ali, Noble Drew Ali, he passed in 1929, which is very interesting because that's one year before the coronation of the King of Kings. And that's also about eight years before the establishment of the true government for our people, the Ethiopian World Federation. Now, are there things that we can learn from, from um, the, the, the Moorish um, experiment or the Moorish endeavor, the Moorish enterprise or establishment? Of course. Of course there are things that, that I think all of these movements shared. A lot of the, uh, there's a lot of common common, um, you know, commonality among the different groups. And we want to touch on a little bit of that right here for a moment. First of all, we have to, right, know our divine heritage. This is the first thing we want to, and we're going to make a link again to the vid that we had put up here. That summarizes as a PSA, our divine heritage. Now, for us, our divine heritage, right, is Ethiopia. Now, we can make the argument, you understand, know that the whole continent was called Ethiopia. I mean, there's positive evidence of that. Now, others, the Moors, perhaps, might disagree on that, but they have to present their evidence, and that's a whole different, that's a different discussion right there. We want to focus on Ethiopia and and, and give um, due credit to Brother Taj Tariq Bey, at least on the information that he provides people about knowing your rights and how to present yourself, correct your status, some of the basics he presents in this. And this connects with the prerequisite to sovereignty. There's some of these things that each of us have to be about. And you know we've been talking about name change. You understand? We've been speaking about those particular elements, and there's other connections with that that needs to be understood. Artificial name. What is artificial, you know, artificial person versus natural person? You understand? And not just how to, not just, not just to know these things, but also to act on it, to, to be about the, to be about, to be about the paperwork. So Ethiopia is our divine heritage. Right? Now, from Amos 9 and 7, in Amos 9 and 7, what do we read in Amos 9 and 7? Remember that was the verse that we had put up there? Some of you all probably know this. Um, we just want to go to the script right here, Amos 9 and 7. It says, Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians to me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord, saith Yahweh? So we see in this particular, um, now this is all connected with the future kingdom blessing. This is all connected with the Lord's return, our black Lord and Savior, Joshua's return. And this is also connected with the reestablishment of the Davidic monarchy. You see, so we're speaking about monarchy. Now, one thing we have to remember that Israel had 12 tribes, right? There were 12 tribes of Israel. But some of the tribes did not remain faithful to the Davidic monarchy. This, this is biblical. This is historical. So, interestingly enough, there's many who say that they are Israelites to this day. There's many who claim to be Hebrews, but they don't make any connection with Ethiopia. 
or they don't make a very positive connection to Ethiopia. In fact, they will say that this verse here in, let's connect this right here, this verse here in Amos 9 and 7, they will say this verse in Amos 9 and 7, they're just talking about that the Ethiopians are black and the Israelites are black, so they use this particular verse to just say that we are black. That's, that's the only reason in their minds, right, for this divine word here in Amos 9, chapter 7, are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians to me, O children of Israel. But if they were to study it, if you study, um, if we say the scripture is divine, right, and, and, and we say it is. Others might have other opinions or assumptions about it. But we say it is. We can look in the structure of this sentence right here and see that Yahweh or the Lord is comparing the children of Israel to the children of the Ethiopians. He's saying to the children of Israel, look at my relationship with the children of the Ethiopians. You, like them, you understand, are special to me. But, but, but there's a key connection. Now, we know this from knowing our divine heritage and knowing of the Kibur Neges and the Queen of Sheba only son Menelik, recognizing that um, biblical, historical, scriptural, cultural link and connection from which comes the renewed establishment of the Davidic monarchy. Sol David had a son named Solomon. Solomon had a son named David, and he would renew the kingdom of David in the biblical land of Cush. And thus is the fulfillment of Psalms chapter 68, verse 31, where it says, Princes shall come out of Egypt, Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto God. Now, this does not mean that all those who call themselves Ethiopians are truly in that divine heritage. Remember what we said right here? Divine heritage. See, now divine heritage is connected with what we know as the holy, right? The holy covenant, right? The holy covenant. You see, there's a covenant. You understand? There's a covenant. A covenant is a contract. A covenant is an agreement, you understand? And we know that any contract or agreement, it, it, it's something that is lawful. You see what I'm saying? This is what restores us and makes us in-laws, you understand, with our Ethiopian, Hebrew, divine heritage. It's this idea and this consciousness of this holy, God, holy covenant, you understand, this holy covenant, this word agreement. Now, historically speaking, those who are Negroes, the majority of those who are Negroes, blacks, and coloreds, their ancestors, as have all of our collective ancestors, turned their backs on that holy covenant. You understand? They lost, they lost sight of who they were. They, and see, the Bible teaches us this. You, you know what I mean? And what's so very interesting that we still have that sickness as a people or black people to this very day, how we will reject what is our own, what so-called African or black, until the foreigner picks it up or does something with it, and then we'll go after it because the foreigner went after it. So when it goes through the foreign perversion or go through the foreign hands, we'll go after it quicker than we would if, than if God himself gave it to us. And this is, this, this is part of the reason why this explains... Um, the Valley of the Dry Bones, and if you want to get some of the deeper history of this historically, learn it and teach it to your children from Babylon to Timbuktu. You understand? Also goes into that historical detail. So the first level of this is learning, is education. You see what I'm saying? But now it doesn't just end there. This is not speculative. It's not a speculation movement. You see what I'm saying? It is an operative and a progressive movement. But we have gotten into 40 or so years of speculation on the part of the majority of ones. One brother who we chatted even reason earlier today was talking about even the marijuana and the herbs and the cannabis. And it's like most are just smoking and joking. 
You understand? And there's too much intoxication because ones are misusing and misapplying the holy. You see, so until we get our house, we have to get our house in order. And discipleship is, is, is the first step of that. Because discipleship speaks about this particular discipline. So here, Amos 9 and 7, here's the connection. So when we say we are, I made some notes right here. Let's see if I can find these notes right here. All right. Yeah, I made some notes. And this is kind of an expansion on the name change. You understand? This is putting the name change into its um into the bigger context of things. Um, the new name, the name change, and uh see where we're at right here. Okay, uh so we have our name, nationality, our name and nationality. Now if you notice the, the preamble to the Ethiopian World Federation where it says um we the black people because that was reaching the people where they were, you understand, reaching the people where they were at. They were still at that. And, and, and what's amazing is that in 1937, you had certain brothers and sisters who were so spiritually and even culturally mature that they were already declaring that they were black people. You have to remember at this time, what, in the 1930s, niggas were still calling themselves Negroes, and maybe at best colored. Not, I mean, even Marcus Garvey, United Negro Improvement Association. So for the Ethiopian World Federation to restore our nationality, this was the step right here, our nationality in the, in the name, right? Our nationality. See, because first we have to learn who we are, where we're from, and how do we get in the situation you understand? And when we learn that scripturally, we also see how we can get ourselves out of the situation with divine guidance. So it's not just about just pray and just, just hope, and, but it's work that we must do. It's, it's fruition. You understand? At the initial level, it begins with a certain amount of belief. You know, belief, belief is like, um, you know, you want to expect the best. Yeah, I, I'll take it, but it's like, it's like trust. But verify. You have to tr you trust. If you, like, if you don't trust what I and I are saying, you're wasting your time. I mean, I mean, you have to trust it, but then you have to verify it. You understand for yourself, and that's the only way you'll know it for yourself. Otherwise, you'll say, "Well, he said it, but I said it because I verified it for myself." You understand? So I know what I'm saying. So in order for you to know what you're saying, you have to verify. So trust, verify. And um, and then we have to act on it. There's some things we have to act on. So there was a name change of the remnant of the people in the 1930s when you had this group of brothers and sisters. They're like pioneers to I and I, right? Forerunners. You know what I'm saying? Um, when they said, we the black people of the world, so reaching the people at the highest level of the so-called racial consciousness of the people. They didn't say, we the Negroes of the world. They didn't say, we the colored people of the world. No, they said, we the black people of the world. And the fulfillment of it is that now our divine heritage, you understand, is Ethiopia. So we, the black people of the world, become we the Ethiopians. Now, some of y'all will say, but Ethiopians don't, listen, can they prove that they're Ethiopians? Nobody can prove you're Ethiopians according to our divine heritage. Anything else, you're talking about people wandering around Africa, you understand, basically. You have to prove a connection to an establish, you understand, an establish and a verifiable history. You understand? And this is what we have in his imperial majesty. We have facts. We got evidence. Anything else is make-believe. People say that, oh, uh, his majesty and, and Ethiopia can't prove such and such. No, they can't prove it because they probably can't even speak the language. They can't look at the archives. They can't look at the records. The white men have done it. That's why they keep, you know, that's why they keep, um, you know, keep interested in everything 
Ethiopian. They they understand what it is. You understand? The reason why Mussolini invaded is because he knew that was important to black people. You understand? He didn't invade the ghetto. You understand? He didn't invade Harlem. You understand? He didn't invade the slum. No, he had to invade Ethiopia because he had to silence that. You understand? That was the stone that wasn't carved or cut by human hands. So we're Ethiopian, but not just Ethiopian. Notice something right here. Notice the link right here, the, the bridge. We are Israel, right? The true remnant is Israel. So you see this link now in our covenant. Now, tribally speaking, we are Hebrews. Tribally speaking, we are Hebrews. Because you have to remember, Hebrews, some interpret Hebrews um, racially speaking. They'll say, well, those who are of the zab, the seed, the sperm, and ovum, the sperm, you can say, of Abraham. You understand, the seed of Abraham. That means we have um, a lot of folks that come from Abraham's seed and through Abraham's um, link. You understand? But the covenant, the covenant keepers is Israel. You understand? Regards Israel right there. So ultimately, you understand, our nationality is Israel. But something funny happened in history. There's the Jews who call themselves the Jews. The Bible warned us about that. So now they call it the state of Israel, and this still confuses a lot of folks to this day. They, they know what the so-called Jews' story is, but they really don't know our story, or they don't recognize or regard our story as being, as being relevant. So we have to make our story relevant, but we have to learn it, and we have to articulate it. We have to defend it, you know what I'm saying, and we have to act in accordance to it. Otherwise, it remains something speculative, something, well, I heard, I read a book. Well, how does that affect our life, you understand, and, and the futures for our children? How did other people do it? So if we learn how other successful examples of people came from a, a state somewhat similar to where we are, you know, then we will learn a lot about what we need to do. So we have the Ethiopian, the Israel connection, and this is also connected with Amos 9 and 7. But the main thing that brings this into its holy aspect is covenant. You understand? It's, it's, it's covenant. And among the Ethiopians, we have, we have the, the so-called black Jews, you know what I'm saying? The black Jews of Ethiopia. We have the Hebrews. You, you know what I'm saying? We have the Hebrews and the Jews. They call them Falasha or the Beta Israel. Now, it's proven that the Falashas at best, the Ethiopian Falashas of the, of the East, they're at best one or maybe two tribes. I mean, this is what's interesting. So, we are the rest of the tribes because the Bible already said what context to look for these people. These people have an Ethiopian connection, which today would say they have an African connection. So in a sense, Ethiopia can be seen as this gateway, you understand, for the remnant, you understand, this link to what we call today Africa. Now, a portion of this people, as we know, were rounded up, were enslaved, you know what I'm saying, were stripped of their, of their names, of their history, of their culture. Now, prophetically, 400 years, right? Prophetically, scripturally, biblically, 400 years. And we have uh, Christopher Columbus discovering America in 14, what? 92. 400 years later was born the son of man, Kedemawi Haile Selassie, in 1892. We have... Um, the Mohammedans invading Ethiopia, you understand, a war taking place, Ahmed Grind War, and what's often not spoken, spoken about, though some Ethiopians know this, um, there was a, a slave trade that took place in East Africa. Some of them were actually even marched across Africa to West Africa to the slave ports. Here's where we get some of the, quote, Ethiopians our Ethiopian heritage, plus continentally speaking, the whole, the whole continent was considered Ethiopians. So when one say we're not Ethiopians, perhaps they're speaking of themselves. But for us, we are Ethiopians in this particular context. 
you see, in this particular context. So the first thing we have to establish is our, is our um, birthright. You see, our birthright, first of all, is that we're Hebrews. Our nationality is that we are Ethiopians. At best, right, in this present legal situation that we are in, we should call ourselves Ethiopian Americans. You see, because we're seeking to reestablish, we have to reestablish on paper in the law before the law or authorities that be. Now, that's important for each individual to understand that. One has to be um, persuaded and have the evidence of who we are, how we got here, where we're from. You know what I'm saying? Then there is the individual work that we have to do. You see, there's the individual work that we have to do to also correct our status. So there's the teaching of name change and correction of status is something that we need to go into in a little more detail. But just before we go, um, um, in this particular portion right here, let's uh, let's get some of this. Um, where is this right here? All right, now this right here is a little booklet that I received from um, one particular brother a couple of years ago, and this was his, um, I think this was his um, um, presentation basically concerning um, before the United Nations and also in his steps in, in declaring his um, um, sovereignty, you know what I'm saying, some of the paperwork in connection with his declaring his sovereignty. But each of us have to do it, you know what I'm saying, if we really are to come out of this. You see, because as it stands already right now, if you have the slave master's name, he still has claim to you. If you're still carrying the slave master's last name, you still, by extension, are the slave master's property. But remember what happened with the emancipation. That means you went or those slaves went from being the property of the individual slave owners now to becoming the government property. And if you really check how we get birth certificates and even driver's license and a lot of these kind of forms, it really came through an effort of of the government and some of the slave masters as well to keep track on the wandering properties, you know, saying the wandering properties, and all of that is part of the artificial personhood that many of us still take. You know, we'll say my name. You know, like when you use things like that, if you go into court and you're carrying say the Babylonian name, and you say, well, well, my name. Well, that's not my name. My name, you know, you know, even saying that in the square, you understand? Basically, remember what Christ said? Christ said every word, you know, will be judged by every word. You understand? And he even talks about the officer and the courts and so forth and so on. Because he understood that it's it's law. See, we have to get our our handle on the law. So Torah. For us as Hebrews, Torah becomes our initial, our kindergarten. In other words, we're studying the Torah because most of us have to come to the level of bar mitzvah. You know what I'm saying? We have to come to that basic level as a, as like a 13-year-old Jewish boy. We're not on that level of sovereignty. You understand? We're not even on that level of sovereignty. You understand? And then we also have to address the, the matter of our name, correcting our name, changing our name. And there's a certain amount of study that goes along with it. But even if you are still using your um, so-called Babylonian or European name, it is very important to start the, the paperwork now. You understand? First of all, to learn about some of these things that we're speaking about and others, as well as in this particular vid right here. This is why we'll recommend this in spite of the little Ethiopia statement. It wasn't said maliciously, you understand? We don't view it as being a malicious statement, you know, we're saying that we're not Ethiopians because the Moors have their own Moroccan, you, you know, their own Moroccan link according to what they believe. And each one is is allowed these um, these particular rights when we go above and beyond just local slave masses laws. For example, here the Declaration of Human Rights says this. Article 15 says, everyone has the right to a nationality. 
You heard that? Everyone, this is what all the nations around the world, whenever there's some crisis in the Middle East or something's happening, they always talk about the UN and all these people getting there and hoping this and that. See, they, bring, they brought their issues before the UN. Unfortunately, our leaders or misleaders or those who claim to be the so-called unelected leaders, Negro, black, and colored leaders, they have caused these issues to be neglected. They basically says, forget it, we're going to trust slave master to work it out. And these people have become intermediaries. So they've gotten rich off of our continued um, downpression and our ignorance. You know what I'm saying? So these international issues we hear about, our cause, as the once lost but now found Beta Israel, has every right to be on that international stage. And see, the reason why some of us are, are preaching and teaching on this is because we know that a generation is coming. It might be here already. That is not going to, that's going to have the knowledge, that's going to know these things. You understand? Like a lot of the children who are coming on now, and, and there's going to be a generation that's going to know these things. It's going to be well versed, more fluent than I and I. And I'm not going to be about any sort of negotiations, you see. And perhaps that's what has to happen for these people to wake up. You know, when we look at Al-Qaeda and look at the world, what's going on, the Jews, the Irish, every other group. Black people had a little bit of that, but, you know, the black people situation in the 60s, a lot of the leaders um, got wind of the real international human rights, Haile Selassie level, too late. It's like they were going the wrong way too long, and by the time they even found out and recognized the vision of his majesty, they had already sown too many weeds and it was too late for them. You look at Dr. King, you look at Shabazz, a lot of them kind of could have been talking about the real deal that Haile Selassie and the other African leaders were dealing with these racial global issues, but instead a lot of Negroes thought, well, we are going to just trust slave master to do better. And now, 40 years later, are we better off? We hear everybody else talking about the global economy. Negroes are just trying to get a little five and dime sort of job because they're not, you know, they are not exercising their full potential. Is that right? Is it right that other folks can be talking about global issues and we only are talking about project, project issues or, you know, like, like um, you know, ghetto issues? We're just limited to ghetto issues and gang violence and, and, and drug selling and stuff like that. What about the global issue? Even some of your hip-hop folks... <laughs> Even some of them are, are whizzing up to level, maybe just selfishly, but still even some of them are beginning, you know, some, your Jay-Zs and the rest of them, you know, they've been around, and Beyonce's, they've been around to Ethiopia and Africa. Um, even Oprah got some investment there as well. So just think about it. Um, everyone has the right to a nationality, everyone. Section 2. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality, nor denied the right to change his nationality. No one. So now who decides what our nationality is? Huh? Is, it, is, it, is it Babylon? Is it even some of the careless, the careless Ethiopians who don't want to accept that we're Ethiopians? Who give a damn? We'll deal with them later. You know what I'm saying? We need to get our father's house in order. Because sometimes folks say, well, ah, uh, some Ethiopians. Because we know that there are the faithful Ethiopians who understand who we be, and they are giving us the support, you understand, um, strategic, tactical, logistical that we need. You understand? And there are some other careless Ethiopian, Uncle Tom Ethiopians, you understand, that hate us. You see, so hopefully I pray that your spirit can distinguish the, the, the holy from the profane. You know, it's like what Revelation says. He who want to be holy, let him be holy. He won't be profane, let him be profane. He won't be clean, let him be clean. He'll be unclean. Let that be them. You understand? If they want to step in our way, stand in our way, go on the record and oppose us, we'll have to deal with it in its proper context. I'm mentioning that because sometimes some of you all allow those things to bother you, sweat you too much, you know, like, um, 
you know, like like you can only stand up for your rights if other people agree that you can stand up for your rights. You know, if, if other people agree, who are they? Those who deny our nationality, who are they? You know what I'm saying? Like the Bible says, many who are of Israel are not. There's many who are of Israel who are not of Israel. And so the Bible even said that 2,000 years ago. Because even they recognized those folks, jokers, calling themselves Israelites, and there was no Israelites. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't about the truth of it. No, they thought that there was some profit to being Israelite. So that's why they did it. You see, we say we're Ethiopian in bad times and in good times all the time. We've said we're Ethiopian, this remnant over here. You understand? We haven't, some of these Ethiopians have sold their identities, have, have, have gotten, um, what they call it again, um, um, have, have denied, dropped their citizenship to become um, half a can American. I mean, it's not judging. We're not condemning. We're judging, but we're not condemning them. You know what I'm saying? But they should not be condemning I and I. If they're going to judge, then give I and I a fair judgment. That means look at all the facts of our case. You understand? Let the evidence, you know, be the judgment. Now, this is interesting because most of us don't even know. This is one page. You're probably going to have to scan some of this and put this online right here. Um, this is one entire, this is probably a very good page. One, it's kind of small print, you understand? But this is one page, Human Rights Declaration, the whole thing on this one page right here. And on the Rastafari issues, we've been speaking a lot about Article 18. Some of you know Article 18, where it says everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change the religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others or in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Observance, right? Now, that's interesting because when we look at Rastafari, a lot of things that we are um, persecuted about, we have a case there. You understand? Know Someone is responsible. Ones and ones who are about these law and so-called order and say and say they uphold these rights. Therefore, if our rights are being denied, somebody is responsible and someone owes us. Whether it's an apology, whether it's a financial um, settlement or reparations or something, you know what I'm saying? That means that we have to be about that work. We can't expect somebody else to 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 be about it. You know what I'm saying? We have to be about that right there. So here in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it is telling us that everyone, remember, all the nations of this earth, you know what I'm saying? I'm to all the nations of the earth that are there, that are nations today, including Ethiopia, has agreed to this Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And and we as Rastafari, we say it's, it, this is because of Hala Selassie. You see, we only have human rights because of Hala Selassie. You know, you know, you know this, is, this is what I and I, I and I say. Now, many of us, I, I could argue the case and bring evidence and prove it. Some other brothers and sisters probably can argue the case as well, too. And that's not the, the point of this uh, vlog right here. This is just to make the statement and we'll back it up or one can look it up for themselves and see whether, you know, whether they can agree you understand, with it or not. But Ethiopia is one of the, the, the first, the signers of this, because when we understand World War um, 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 I and World War II and what happened with the fascist aggression and invasion of Ethiopia and the righteous and the godly stance that Haile Selassie took, you understand, against this insanity, you understand know this diabolical plot of Satan, the devil, against God's people? You know, that's, that, ex that explains it right there. You know what I mean? Some folks are not going to get it because, as Judge Judy would say, so they're idiots. You know what I mean? For real, let's, let's keep it moving. They, step, they stand in our way. Well, we have to move them out of our way. You understand? Know but we have a way before us, and that's what we need to focus on, the way, the truth, and the life, not these little side issues. A lot of these are, are, are side issues, and while there is time, you understand, while there is the opportunity, while there is standing government and authorities, we need to make our lawful case. Because we can't do that how we're talking about government, how we're talking about Melchizedek and government, you understand, and we can't even deal with basic paperwork, you understand? 
once you got your reading, writing, arithmetic, if, if you're bad at your reading, go go take one of these programs. For real, go go on one of these programs. If you had shame, if you got too much shame to up your reading, then you're an idiot. Yeah, you know, for real, if you got too much shame to improve those things, because you're limiting your own life and your potential for yourself and for your family. You know what I'm saying? Because those are some of the excuses that some folks give. You know, some of the excuses that some folks give, like, I don't want to read English, I want to read Amharic. Is it because you have a problem reading English? You know what I'm saying? Come on, let's, let's understand this. It's not your fault. Most times it's not most people's fault. But they're walking around with it almost like as a guilt, like, as a sinfulness, and they need to repent of that, learn how to read, learn how to write, get in these, get in Torah, Scripture, and then, and then start to hit these law books as well. But first, the Torah will really help to ground you once you get into a good Torah study, a good discipleship study. And we hope that our presentation is at least helping ones to recognize the importance thereof. We're going to conclude this portion on this right here. Let us go to um, Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. This is one of my old favorite verses. I know I say that a lot to a lot of verses. Because you find that a lot of verses, they are favorite in different ways. You know, it's like on that thought, that verse right there just sums it up right there. You know, it clears up a, a lot because there's a science to this. See, we're approaching this scientifically. A lot of folks approaching it, quote, religiously or on, on some foggy level, you know, some, some fuzzy spookism. This is no spookism. You understand? Our black Lord and Savior, no spook. You understand? Our black Lord and Savior said, You should know the truth and the truth. <laughs> 